Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor. Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it. Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Real estate experiment, what is happening, y'all? Today I got my man, Chris Craddock. Did I get that right, Chris Craddock? Yes, sir. That's right it. from the other side, you're dialing in from, um, D is it DC, you said? Yep, Washington, D.C. Area. I live in Virginia, but I'm literally in yeah. D.C. Yeah. Funny, I just, we just had a friend who's going to be uh, moving out there. And I'm, I'm honestly so excited to have you in the lab because I want to level set for a second. You know what I mean? Because we, we have a lot of people who step in the lab and you are very niched and unique in that sense. And so the introduction, of course, to you is you are, you've been not only you've created a monster team, monster systems, uh, you're a licensed Ke Keller Williams agent. And, and it seems like you were investing in the beginning and now you're uh, a head honcho of the Redux group. You run, you run that. You also, I mean, you've led to multi-million dollar in sales uh, and very impressive. And you also have some programs, which uh, I think I'm very, uh, I'm very interested to dive into. Uh, but you're also a personal development guy, right? Life coach. I saw that on there as well. So you got a lot under your belt that I want to kind of like unravel a little bit. Uh, but before we do that, I want to get an opportunity, to get you to introduce yourself. Who was Chris before and who is Chris now during this journey that you've kind of created for yourself? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so my adult life, you know, I, I, I graduated from college, went on staff with an organization called Young Life. It was awesome. I loved it. Changed my life. But I made 20 grand a year and living in the D.C. area, making 20 grand a year does not work when you have a family. Okay. So when my wife got pregnant, I started uh, um, flipping houses and just to make ends meet. And um, yeah, I ended up uh, you know making like 12 times what I made in a year and in, in about four months. And that was great. Continued doing ministry. And then as I had more kids... Um, got back into the whole flipping side of stuff. But at that point, it was all short sales because the market had changed. And uh, so I got my license because the bank was paying real estate agents a percentage on the short sales. And um, yeah, then uh, ended up reading Gary Keller's MREA book. I'd gone back to school and got a doctorate in, in leadership. And uh, the Mill Millionaire Real Estate Agent book just made a lot of sense. And so then I uh, started our team. We grew really fast. I mean, this uh, this year we're going to do about a hundred and you know, right under 160 million in volume, about 600 transactions on and off market. And, um, yeah, this is our, our fifth year really running the team. So, you know, we grew real fast. So, so let's take a step back, Chris, cause I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So did you say in the beginning, I want to make sure I captured that correctly in the beginning where you, you didn't have a license before you got into real estate or you got into your real estate license. Then you got into real estate and started simultaneously being interact, uh, interacting with off market and on market. What, what came first? No, I, I was flipping houses before I had a license and then I got okay. a license, you know, afterwards because I was doing a lot of short sales um, and they were just paying an agent. So I might as well get paid. <laughs> got it. Got it. So you, you, you talk about this very interesting model because, a lot of, you know, the agents, um, so I think this is good for, for you to be here in the lab with us because a lot of agents, I think we see a lot of retail stuff. We see a lot of, you know, what, you know, multi-million dollar listing, like all the, all that cool stuff. And a lot, there's not a lot of agents that you know, work with investors. And, you know, what I've looked into you, it's really interesting because you're saying there's, there's actually an opportunity uh, for uh, realtors or real estate agents to be specifically targeting or working within the niche of investors, how, how, how did you manifest that or see that opportunity? I'm guessing it because that was your background, but you know, how did you close that gap and what gap is it that you're really closing that some uh, real estate agents aren't really seeing? Well, man, I'll tell you, there's, there's a number of pieces here. So the first thing I would say is this, um, it is so, so, so important for us to, you know, if we're, if, if, it's a real estate agent looking at this. If you're not in the investor niche, you need to get into that because Grant Cardone says the number one problem with real estate agents is that they don't buy their own product, right? Like that is it. If you're not buying and sell, if you're not buying real estate for yourself, and I'm not just talking about flipping. Everybody thinks that investor means flipping, which yeah. flipping is great, but flipping is just a transaction, right? You just, instead of a, you know, whatever your commission is, $10,000, $15,000, $8,000 commission, you're getting hopefully a twenty-five dollars to $50,000, $100,000 commission. It's still just a commission, right? It's a transaction-based 
product. But the difference is when you buy and hold, when you're buying a property, buying uh, properties to rent, you're getting cash flow. You're getting something that continues to pay. It's it's something that like residually pays out okay. over time. And that's the real key there is how do you get things that continue to pay out um, rather than just getting you know paid once per transaction. So that's a huge thing there. And then for me, because of the fact that I was so involved in the investor niche. I, I just realized, man, I've got to get, um, you know, I've got to figure out how to make, instead of fighting for that next deal on the agent side, how do you get a deal that turns into five deals? So you find one investor, maybe one flipper that is going to buy a house from you. He's going to flip it and then going to resell it. And then when you list it, it's going to be nicer than most houses out there. So you run an open house and that turns in your listings, create babies and you get more deals. So right there, that one person, you do that five times with them. One new client that you found brings you 10 deals plus however many listings you can parlay into new deals. So that's one of those huge things there. And and then, you, then, so I, I started going after that and then I took it to that next level and I said, okay, what about these flippers, wholesalers, these other people that are out there paying tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars every month for leads, for uh, distressed properties, like what are they doing with them? They're, they're basically throwing them in the trash. Um, if they can't flip or wholesale them. And, and I'll tell you, they've all tried to work with agents. They, they all have, they all have tried to work with agents but the agents have not been able to close those deals because the agents don't treat it correctly. And so for me, that was one where I've gotten tied in with some investors here locally and it's really grown my business. But not only that, but man, I just sent $60,000 worth of referral fees last month alone to, uh, to investors here locally because of the fact we took their deals, turned them into listings and literally sent them $60,000 in referral fees last month alone. That's crazy. So tell me, let's take a step back for a second, Chris. Like, what is the opportunity? Why, why aren't we seeing? What do you think most agents aren't you know, thinking of that? Is it because, and, and I can, I have my ideas because I've, I've been in this space and I work with real estate investors and I have my license as well. But what are your thoughts as to why an agent might not even have thought of that as an opportunity? And when I say thought of that, I mean working with investors is it just because it's not a sexy they take too long their criteria are too complex though you know what is it for you that you feel you've heard because i know you also do some coaching and, and, and you're able to serve others and help them kind of get to where you're at so what it, what is some of that pushback that you constantly hear yeah i mean what you focus on expands that's the way life works right and so i think they're not focusing on it i think that's the big problem is they're not thinking about it they're, it's daunting they're worried about that and so um that's that is the big uh, the big issue for me is that they need to look at at this. They need to understand the space. They need to do their research so that they can speak intelligently to it and then jump in and and start doing business. Because I mean, honestly, the people that make money are the ones that solve people's problems. And so if you look at it and say, okay, um, these investors they've got leads here, they're paying for them. You know, can I solve their problem? Boom. Then then you're winning. But the problem is you know, what we see is like such vanilla real estate, which is why, I mean, I'm just telling you, it's why all the discount brokers are out there, why the red fins of the world are out there because, you know, agents aren't adding value. Like, like 6% commission agents aren't adding value. And frankly, I don't think they deserve 6% if they're not adding value. And so that's the whole thing is like, if, if, if you're not going to figure out a way to up your game and be different and differentiate yourself from everybody else, you don't deserve to get paid a full commission. You should work on a discount. But I'm telling you, that's not who I am or anybody in my world wants to be. And I think uh, I think there's a lot of people, just by nature of the fact they're listening to your podcast and working to level up, I think the people on this call are probably saying that's not who I want to be either. Yeah. Well, before I get into that, because I know you make a point on the commission part, and I want to talk about that. And and I want to talk about how the, the gap as well. Um, I do want to touch on the fact and maybe piggyback the comment that, you know, personally for me, when I got into the realist, uh, my, my license was because I was never trying to be an agent. I was trying to be an investor. 
And so I saw it as a way to add value to your point by having a license, because then I could have, you know, access to maybe MLS deals that they maybe haven't come, came, come across, you know, whether it's their mailing campaigns or that, you know, it's kind of like giving them a lot more comparative market analysis, et cetera. So I think it's important for people to listen to that because I think sometimes, you, you know, we wear these titles and then you're not like a listing agent, you're a problem solver. Any way you can find a way to, add value. Um, so speaking of that value, talk about commission for a second. I know that's one thing you talk about, um, or you've mentioned, and I want to see if you still, you know, stand by it. And, and I know you talk about the commission, but you, you don't even believe that some people, you know, are worth 6% because they're just doing, you know, the bare minimum, you know, now how, how do you, I think you mentioned before, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, actually getting more than the 6%, you know, what does that look like uh, for an agent who's listening? Like, Oh, wait, I can actually, charge more like okay well how does that look like and and what should i be bringing to the table to separate myself from the agent next door yeah so so don't get me wrong i do have people that i do a lot of business with and i i'll i'll give a reduced commission because of the amount of business we do do together and that's absolutely builders you know flat fee commissions you know some of that stuff investors where we're, we're going to do like 30 40 deals for them sure you know that that's fine and also and it's it's also something when you look at the value of your time when you can talk have one phone call and discuss five listings or whatever it, it's it's different than when you're dealing with the emotional side and investors are also if you're dealing with a seasoned investor they're much more analytical versus you know, an average homeowner where it's more emotion and you're an psychologist as much as you are a real estate agent. <laughs> so there's a, there's a piece there where, you know, that helps. But with that said, if you are like our market, I believe that the average listing commission is 4.2% um, is, is what the average commission is that the agents in our market take. We take over for, for the non builder deals um, that we're working on. Um, you know, we take, I think it's 6.1% is our average. So we are taking over 6% like on average. And oftentimes, I mean, we've taken eight, I, I mean, I took a 9%. I don't, I'm not, doing tons of production myself right now because my team is doing most of it. But I took a 9% commission earlier this year because of the fact that we're solving problems. And as soon as you're talking, as soon as you're an agent, they're asking and they're fighting with you on commission. As soon as you're talking about bottom line and what you can do for them and how you can solve their problem, they're no longer talking about that because you're helping them get what they want. You're helping them do what they want. And that's when you're winning. I love that. I actually had a gentleman who stepped into the lab, uh, shout out to Phil M. Jones. And he talked about this is a big deal with pitching. I think people pitch without asking, well, how much would it mean to you or how much money would you lose without me? And, and then you know, putting it in that way or how much money can I make you? And then based on that, making an offer, right? Because when you look at the bottom line, if I can make you, you know, 300K, 400K, half a million, maybe a million, and you put that into perspective with all that I'm going to do for you, would you mind if I got six percent of that seven percent and then it puts things in perspective well of course you're bringing me so much to the table and i think it's really important for us to maybe switch that paradigm shift sometimes to your point and really you know come from a value point not just i'm an agent don't like pigeonhole yourself you're just you're, you're someone here to solve a problem add value out so i really do like that um yeah and, and absolutely. I mean, I just had somebody, um, one of the agents of my team asked if I'd jump on a call with an investor, a newer investor, and they were like already trying to beat us up over commission and, and everything like on the first call. And I'm like, I'm like, so wait, you're saying that if I bring you a deal where you're going to make X number of dollars that you think I should get paid less just because why? And they, they were, you know, they're like, well, you know, I can work with other agents. I was like, well then, find another agent because I'll tell you what, I've got, a, I've got a line of people that want to work with me because I'll tell you, I find off market deals and you know what, there's people, a lot more people have, have money in this, in this market. People have more dollars than they have cents right now. So if, uh, if that's really the case, you know, you can, you can go find somebody that'll do a discount, but good luck finding a deal with one of these discount people. And so then they, uh, yeah, they backed off that real quick, you know, but, but that was part of it. It's like, they come strong at you like that. It's like, well, no, I know my worth. I know my value. I, I've got a waiting list of people that want to work with me because I'm making the money. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so this is a good segue because you, you talk about off market deals uh, and you just mentioned that um, you talk about turning trash leads into cash. Right. And I, and I think that's fascinating. And I'm very curious as to 
you know, if you could maybe try to level set for someone who's just listening into what you mean by that and where you feel that this is one of the opportunities that we're talking about for experimenters out there, because we like that proof of concept, you know, what, what does that um, opportunity look like when you say that, 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 that you, there's trashy leads or leads that, that are trash that, you know, I don't think the leads are trash. I should take a step back. What I'm saying is that whatever is left over due to the lack of follow-up uh, is an opportunity. How do you tackle that opportunity? Yeah. So, well, well, the trash leads I'm talking about are actually um, from investors, not from agents. Yeah, like, literally, they're just throwing them in the trash. Like, and and I would say that that the reality is for them, they're not good leads because they're people that want to sell closer to retail price. And if they're looking to flip, they just can't do it. So that's that's that whole thing. But the reality is. One man's trash is another man's treasure, right? Yeah, like, yeah. So- and can you can you take a step back? Because I, I think like I'm connecting dots. I know exactly what you're talking about. But just just for our listener, just in case you're not ca- 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 catching on to what Chris is saying, uh, do you want to maybe talk about the, the specific scenario where you know an investor is not looking at a specific deal, and then that can become an opportunity for maybe you know an agent to to come in on the retail side? Can you just level set a little bit? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, let's say let's say somebody wants to buy. Like somebody says, "Hey, I want to sell my house. Um, it's worth three hundred thousand as it sits right now." Well, if you're an investor that's going to buy it and flip it, right? Um, and they say, "You say I, I give you a call. You say your house is worth three hundred, or, or I give you a call. I look and I see it's worth about three hundred, and you tell me you want two sixty for the house, right?" So at 260, you're talking about closing costs. You're talking about agent fees, all the other all the other pieces there. There's no money in it. You can't buy it and make money at that that price. Like all the money is taken up. Maybe you make a little bit of money, but it's definitely not tie, worth tying up your money for that. So for that deal, most agents or most investors would say, "Hey, you know, I could give you 200. I can give you 180, something like that." And they'll say, "No." you know, tell you where you can go and where you can stick it and all the other stuff. And, uh, um, and then they just say, okay, cool. Next. And, and for an investor, like that lead is dead. It really is. I mean, you, maybe you'll send another message a year later or six months later or three months later. Hey, have you thought about selling your house? But blah, blah, blah. But the reality is they're not going to likely sell at that, at the price. That yeah. They, they want their retail price. In other words. Yeah. So they're just sitting there. The retail deals are just sitting there and uh, like in the trash can. And so that's where an agent can come in and convert that and actually become a, um, yeah, and, and actually make it turn the trash into cash and turn it into a listing. So what does that look like as an agent from listening to this? Am I then partnering with uh, multiple, again, obviously I think that's the lowest hanging fruit. Am I partnering with local investors who then are, you know, sourcing some of their own leads? And I'm saying, what does it look like? Am I saying, hey, Chris, man, if you're, uh, an investor, you got some stuff that you're not interested in, kick it back my way. Like, what does that literally tactically look like for you when you're implementing this strategy? Yeah. So depending on the situation, a lot of the investors ha- are licensed. And so, you know, you're giving a referral fee, the ones that aren't, sometimes you can work, work out some sort of joint venture together if they're paying a lot of money for that. So there's just a, w- a lot of ways to, to solve the problem um, where you can, can do, do what you need to do. You know, I worked with a respite attorney to, um, to create like some joint venture type um, mm. situations that can work. Um, for that. So there, there are ways to, to get that done. But essentially what you're doing is you're going to the investors, you're saying that uh, you'd like to convert their deals. Well, here's the deal. Most of these investors, if they're big investors, they've tried it, they have an agent, they whatever, and it's just not worth their time because frankly, they're not closing them. And I'll tell you, it's because most real estate agents don't know how to close them, which is why we created our system to close it. Because even good agents, they still treat these deals like you know, that like a regular agent would. And the reality is an investor didn't call a, or, or a distressed seller didn't call an investor being willing to sell under market to talk to a real estate agent. They called an investor. So you have to understand the psychology of this person in order to close it well. And once you understand that, then you can close. And so that's our, that's the whole class we're teaching is, is how to rethink about who these people are and what they think and how to solve their problem. And again, goes back to 
you are the problem solver. The people that solve problems make the money. So this is interesting because I actually didn't even realize that you're tackling it from both angles. And and so one thing I want to re- reiterate is you mentioned that possibly there are some other agents that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but there are some other agents that are investors or are investors that have their license that where you could structure a referral, right? Uh, because they're looking at, you know, invest and flip it, et cetera. And you're, you might, it might be an opportunity for you to list actual, you know, market price. Uh, and then it sounds like on the other angle, you're saying that there's an opportunity where sellers themselves, which could be investors or maybe just your, you know, vacant homeowner, wh- whatever the, the case might be, um, is also operating differently. And, and you guys, you're coming in and what your foundation of knowledge is, you're coming in and you're, you're understanding where that person is. It's not like a million dollar listing. It's not like it's a very different feel. Now, um, one thing I'll, I'll ask is uh, idea also in your training that some of these um, sellers are also not interested in working with agents and they want to do the for sale owner and they are reaching out to investors. Is that also part you know, in that, in that ballpark as well? Or I, mean, I guess anything goes, right? I mean, that, that's the whole thing. You just got to understand the objection handlers and, and how to create the system because yeah, most of these people, I mean, they just, they, they don't want to talk to an agent until because they think the agent can't solve their problem. That's that's the whole thing. And like again, it goes back to the like the Zig Ziglar model. You can have everything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want in life. Absolutely. And so these these folks are in this mindset that an agent isn't who's going to be able to solve their problem. And that's why you create the system, the model that literally solves their problem. And once you solve their problem, man, you're off to the races. That's awesome. So let's dive deep a little bit in the keeping it real segment. So I want to get into the, the, the weeds a little bit. I mean, you're a systems guy, you got a team. Um, would you say right now, if we're looking at an overview in your business, is it primarily uh, the model we've just talked about? Or have you also gone into the retail space as well? Cause I know you were, uh, you know, you're flipping as well. Like do you guys do flips? Do you guys do anything that comes your way? Or do you actually say no to business? Which is interesting because that's the thing where I'm learning to say no to business sometimes. And I'm trying to I'm still trying to figure that one out. So maybe we can learn a thing or two from Chris, depending on what you do. So tell us a little bit about the overview breakdown of the business right now. Sure. Yeah. So I've actually got eight, eight businesses, all, you know, that are synergistic to, to love my that. I love that vertical integration is what we call it. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I was actually just, just on a, on a phone call with somebody about, uh, about my insurance company um, before, right, right as you're jumping on. So yeah, so we got just a bunch of them. Like, and I'm not gonna let that slip through the cracks. I'm, I'm, I'm this is gonna be selfishly just for me because we love to talk about this, like businesses that feed one another. Just real quick, real overview. You said eight. I'm very curious now. I'm sure some of the listeners are as well. Did you construct those simultaneously over time? How did those come together a little bit? Give us a little bit of a big overview so we can check you out and follow you. Yeah, over t- they, they all happened over time and it all every every action comes from an idea. And the idea came from a business coach of mine who was like, why get paid once on a transaction when you can get paid five times on a transaction in a compliant way, right? Absolutely. You know, and, then he, and then he said you can get more clients or you can get more of the client or you can get both. <laughs> you know, and so that's where you you get really excited about that is how do you get more of of each client, you know, get paid five times, get paid six times. And so yeah, um, the first one, you know, the, the easiest one to jump into in, in Virginia, D.C., Maryland, for me, because I had a good a good buddy who was building a law firm at the same time, we, we started Title together. And so Title was great. And Title is, you know, a very good, it's, it's, it's very good for us. <laughs> you know, uh, I that, love it. Yeah. So, so we got Title. Um, my brother was a superintendent for a large construction company. And so we, uh, we started a company. We were doing all construction, punch out, everything. Then we realized punch out is terrible because it's so hard and like so tedious and you make no money on it. And then we- uh, And, we and what is that for our listeners, punch out? I'm actually not even that familiar as well. Sorry, sorry. Like when somebody somebody has home inspection items, like touch up paint, um, Cosmetic? you know, you know G, GFIs or, or whatever. Oh, okay, got Just, it. Just little things. And so, so then we moved to only doing like kitchens, bathrooms and additions, right? Which you have a massive markup on that. Then we moved to like full house gut jobs in DC where it's like the markup is every, like we will work for an investor, do their whole project. And, you know, you know, we, we get paid over six figures per, 
per deal we work with wow. with an investor doing their project. So I bring the investor, we get paid there. We do the deal, we get paid there. You know, we I sell the house, we get paid there. So so again, you're looking for how you do all that. Um, one of my actually, this is one of my favorite uh, ones, and actually, it was the one I wanted to stay so far away from. And my buddy just dragged me into it, kicking and screaming. And now I love it because it's got an MLM component to it, which multi-level marketing, like an Amway type thing. And I was like, ah, no, I don't want. Like, I want nothing to do with all that. But I signed up for the service. I use the service because of all the investors, clients that I use, and you know, I, I've got a fairly decent, you know, footprint of influence where I'm able to help other people get into, you know, stuff that's helpful. And so it's called legal shield. It's like, have you heard of that? Oh, I got to check it out. I'm writing it down right now. We're going to have that in the show notes, legal shield. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you the, I'll send you guys the information. And actually the really cool thing, again, it's an MLM. So I'd love to have you, maybe you sign up and we all sign up. Yeah, we all win. We all win. <laughs> but, but, uh, but the cool thing, it's a prepaid legal. And so um, what it is for any investor Literally every single investor should have the ability to call an attorney because I don't know about you, but early on in my career when I was doing investment stuff, I'm like, I should probably get this looked at by an attorney, but I don't want to pay $250 for this. So ah, it looks right. I'm going to go with it. You know, but I could have got myself into so much trouble early on. But when you're paying literally $35 a month to, uh, to have unlimited billable hours with an attorney, wow. um, I had some probate deals that I was working, which, you know, if you don't know probate, it's when somebody dies, uh, you know, dealing with that, you know, being able to get on the, the phone with the attorney, walk through it. Um, I had, for one of my uh, one of my businesses, my rental portfolio, I had somebody that wanted to sue us for not giving back a security deposit after they destroyed our place. And the cool thing is, with Legal Shield, if you pay a certain amount of money, they will defend you in court if anybody ever sues you for Jeez. free. It's all part of it. And so, like when they found out that I had them on retainer and I did, it wouldn't cost me anything, um, they realized that they weren't going to go to go forward with trying to sue me over the the security deposit, which they would have lost anyway. I mean, they destroyed the house. We had a, we had record of what they did, oh and gosh. so. Um, so yeah. Anyway, like that. That to me is just just one other area that the things that are just. I mean, it, it's just really good. But but that's the whole thing. Oh, and and as an agent, I mean, literally one of the agents on my team. Um, he signed up like three months ago and every single person that he's done a deal with since then, I mean, because they also, they'll give you a will for free. So everybody that buys a house, you can either pay $1,500 to an attorney or get a will that is done for you for free and have it updated, that, you know, once a year. So it's, that's it's, insane. <laughs> I got I to look into this. That's insane. Bro, I'll send you, I'll send you the details and uh, yeah, yeah, put it out and then tell everybody to sign up under you because like, it's good. Any agent should do it. Oh, and, and the other piece too is the guy, you know, and this is one of the things where I didn't like the MLM piece, but you know, Jim Rohn, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And so the people that brought me in, like MLMs, you just don't make much money on most MLMs. You know, the people that brought me in are all making you know, over, over half a million dollars a year. One of them is making over $2 million a year. And so it's like, these are the people that I spend time with, which, you know, those are the people I want to spend time with, which is why, you know, in a matter of a few months, you know, just in just these side conversations like this, this wasn't a real show conversation. It just happened to come up as you were asking about other businesses. I wasn't even thinking about talking about it, but now like I bring in almost 15 grand a month, you know, just, just from them. I'm not doing other things with it. It's just, that's insane. That. So it's, wow. It's crazy. Like, I mean, and that's the whole thing is if you look at and do work with the right opportunity, it's great. But you know, the other side is like, I, I've gotten opportunities for home inspection businesses and for, you know, back office, you know, like all these other businesses where I, like you said, say no, where I needed to say no to those things because of the fact that the opportunity just wasn't big enough. I don't, I think if, if you're not looking at at an opportunity that has a high enough upside, it's just going to rob you from those things that do have that upside. Yeah. Do you run that through? Like, I'm curious because at your level, you're, do you run that through like some kind of framework? Cause I know I have mine and I don't, you know, I'm curious. And you're, you're definitely way ahead of the game. Uh, what, what is some, maybe, maybe it's a few questions you ask yourself, you know, um, I'll you tell you, I did ask one question. Yeah. Can I, in, in all my businesses have not gotten there. I've, you know, all of them are, are profitable. Well, there's one that's break even, which is the bane of it. Like, I hate, like, it's just, I'm a competitive guy. And I feel like, like what you make, it's not about money. Like, please understand me. It's not about money. Money is the scoreboard. And I like to win, right? Like yeah. that's the whole thing. And so, um, but, uh, um, 
But yeah, the, the question I ask is, can this business net me seven figures within three years? That's the question. That's, a, that's the only question I ask. And if it can't, I don't, I, I now say no to it. If it can, I, I, I do it because that's, that's where I'm at in my life is like, like this is, you know, if it's not a seven figure net opportunity, it's not worth my time. And, and I, I, that sounds ridiculous, but I, but it's also so important that you have to value and, and protect your time. Yeah. And, and I think that that framework, whatever that number is to, to your listener, like, put that into perspective because opportunity costs and getting distracted and whatever that is, you know, it could be six figures for someone else. Five could be, you know, if in the billionaire's room, which the room we all want to be in, it it might be, you know, nine, 10, right. So whatever that is. Right. So uh, that's very interesting. I appreciate you sharing that. And that again, um, that's what the lab is all about. Like you said, the billionaire room, you know, I love what uh, Dave, uh, Dave Ramsey says. He's like, when I, when I hung out with hundred heirs, I was a hundred heir. When I hang out with thousand heirs, I was a thousand heirs. He's like, now I'm a multimillionaire and I'm, I'm working to hang out with billionaires. And yeah, yeah and I, I think about that all the time. I'm like, man, will I get in that room with other billionaires? And they'll all be like, <laughs> poor little guy, you're saying a million dollar business in three years. Come on, that's a waste of your time. You know, but that's that whole thing is like, yeah. every time you get to a new level, you think on a bigger level and then yeah. all of a sudden the world unlocks and you can't unsee what you just saw. So, yeah. um, you know, and, and and the last last thing I'll say about this, um, you know, Ben Kenny uh, used to put on the seminar that I went to when I first started in real estate. Mm-hmm. And I was just cleaning out one of my bookshelves. And I found this thing, like literally the first month I was in, and I was in ministry, man, I was making no money. I was like literally at the poverty line. And, uh, and it said on there, write down what your dream number was. And I wrote down a number. And because I, I guess I was fearful, I, I don't know, there was whatever, I, I crossed it off and yeah. wrote down a smaller number. Yes, and, I know. And the crazy thing is, I showed my wife and I was like, look at this. I was like, this was my crazy stretch number. And now I make three times what that stretch number was that I crossed off because it was too much. And that was, that brother is, is the whole thing where you start learning to think bigger and you realize that like your small thoughts will keep you captive to a small life and you got to think bigger. Bombs. I'm telling you that that's so powerful. And, and it's so, and I love hearing that because uh, uh, you'll love this. I recently read read a book called built to serve by Evan Carmichael. Uh, You probably know him. Um, I actually got a chance to, to be on his podcast a couple years back and it was, um, you know, one of the words I realize is, is my words when I did the exercise and everybody should do it. Um, it's manifestation, right? Like the power of like literally, and it's crazy because I think about this all the time. Like I can look back and this is not to be in a, by any means in a cocky way, it's a more reflective way. Like, damn, I need to dream bigger because everything that I said I was going to do. And I'm a big believer of that. Anybody knows that my follow-up game is strong. Like if I'm calling you back, I'm calling you back. Uh, that's my, that, those are my core values. Like I must follow up. Um, so whatever I say, whatever I say I was going to do, I did it. And and it means, and, and sometimes you look at where I'm at, I'm like, well, I'm not where, you know, where I want to be. I want more. So then I need to start making bigger goals. Cause when you say you do them, you end up doing them. And, and to you, it goes back to that too, of like the opportunity. Well, if you take the wrong opportunity, then you might just get what you want right? If you yep. want that six figure job, you'll get that six figure job. If you want a million, you know, you'll, you'll get the seven figures and the eight. And so I think I just love how you put that together because I, I do truly believe in that. And I think everybody, if you got anything from this, I think it is that think bigger. Um, so great segue, think bigger. This is we're trying to wrap up here, but this is important um, because when you talk eight companies, when you talk vertical integration, when you talk teams, one word that comes to mind in my world is, is systems. And I think we talked about this offline. I'd love to hear a little bit, uh, you know, how important have systems been for you? Maybe they haven't, maybe you've had someone handle the systems, but how does it look like in your operation? You just say you're more of the systems guy, you hire people, your partner with people who are good with systems. What does it look like in your world? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I hire those people. I, I literally have to fight to be organized in my life. And uh, so I, I hire, I hire out on that. So, you know, one of my favorite books, uh, Rocket Fuel, there's another book called uh, Traction, you know, yes. there's, there's the visionary and the integrator. And, you know, I, I think they say only one in 300 businesses have both of those in the same world, because usually the visionary gets mad. They're, they're like, 
oh, the integrator's slowing me down. They're holding everything up. They're not doing everything right. And the integrator looks at the visionary and says, all right, slow down. You're making what are you, nuts? <laughs> yeah, stop it. And, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, I'm just thankful because I look at our organization and, and I've just been blessed to be in business with like a lot of integrators who are so high level. And I'm really high energy in case you haven't told, no, noticed. So, so with that, like I, I'm pushing all these integrators. But the reality is when I was in ministry, I made some really bad decisions where some people that weren't built like I was, I pushed them too hard and I didn't, I didn't respect their gifts. And I learned that the hard way. And so now that I'm, I am where I am, where they didn't want to be in the world anymore that I was in because I was pushing them too hard. I wasn't respecting where they were. And I'm like, why aren't you more like me? Why aren't you thinking like me? And then as I grew as a man, as I matured and became you know, just better at what I did, all of a sudden I realized their gifts make my gifts better. Their gifts temper me. There are times where I need to say, okay, guys, we are going to move faster here. But most of the time, I've learned that if I don't listen to them when they're saying, hey, take take heed, take caution, then yeah. I'm going to make a very bad mistake. And most of the time, and, and see, the, the key is that I have such a high, of, a high level of love and trust and respect for them that I'm going to respect their opinions. When they say slow down, I'm going to slow down and look at it. But they also know that because I love and respect and trust them, when I say, guys, we got to move, they're willing to move. So we found a place where we, we compromise and actually bring out the best in each other most of the time. So that's kind of how that works and how most of our systems get built is I literally, you know, this is, <laughs> this is the analogy I use. I'm like, man, okay, there's a wall that needs to be built here. I take the sledgehammer and I open up that wall, you know, and you can, you can walk in like, oh, sorry, there's a door that needs to be built. I take the sledge, I open up the door through the wall, I take down the wall and there's the door there. But it's an ugly, 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 ugly thing but I am moving because I'm all about massive action. I'm getting that, that door open. But then all the integrators that I have in my life come and they'll trim up the door. They'll make it pretty. All of a sudden they'll put great, nice hinges on there and great door hardware and make it pretty. But that was the whole thing. At the beginning, I had to, I had to do it all myself. You know, in, in Gary Keller, we call that leading with revenue. I just went out and made it rain. I made, brought money in. And then my business earned the right to hire those, those implementers. And once I hired them, then I would go out and do more things and give them more of the stuff that that they do well. And I just would like compress, you know, we all know the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle, you know, 80% of your act of your of your results come from 20% of your effort. And I just start focusing more and more on that 20% and having more of those days being in my 20%. Mm. So well said. I love that. Love that, love that. Well, right before we, we segue into a uh, core rapid fire question to wrap it up, I do have a question from the audience. Uh, this one is from Gabe from Florida. Um, question is, have you ever wholesaled a deal and was also the buying uh, agent during the deal? And I, and I think where this question is coming from is it can get very tricky sometimes because I think some brokerages are Again, they don't understand the investor side either as well. Some don't know what wholesaling is. And so um, is is it possible? And have you structured that in a way where you can be an agent and wholesale a deal at the same time, I think is what he's asking. Yeah, well, I guess the question I would ask is why would you buy a wholesale? Like, are, are you... I guess the question... Maybe the question, I should clean it up a bit, is it, you're, you're, maybe you have a license, it sounds like. You're an agent and you're also trying to wholesale a deal. Okay. Um, what I would say is yes, I have wholesale deals as an agent, but if you sign a if you sign a listing agreement, you have a fiduciary responsibility to that seller, and then you cannot wholesale a deal. Um, now, what you can do is um, if you bring a buyer and you are the listing agent, you can um, you can tell the buyer that they have to pay more more commission. So in our area, we'll do, I'll do a 6% commission. We'll keep three and a half percent and offer two and a half to the buyer. You know, we've brought in buyers on deals and charged them, you know, 4%, 5% commission on deals. Um, so that's, that's the deal there. But also that's interesting. You charge it to the buyer, you tack it on the buyer as opposed to the, to the list. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. If, so I don't know that I would wholesale a deal and buy it because then the wholesale fee goes to my company 
and my I, I would just reduce the price and, and buy it at a lower price. Um, you know, if I'm the buyer, um, I, I don't know why I would put a wholesale fee in there. I guess. Yeah. And I guess if you're a wholesaler, would that be different if you weren't looking, if you're literally like, this is not an, a project that works for you, you have a license, but you're trying to pass it on to somebody else, I guess. Is there a way to not, maybe, maybe we can get them on legal shield or something. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that or if. Yeah. I mean, what I would say is if somebody else is wholesaling the deal, um, yeah, you, you can, you can do, you can add commission. You can add as much commission as you want on, on there. I mean, I've got a deal literally right now where, um, you know, a wholesaler that I do a lot of business with, which is just great because you find off market deals and, and there's not much inventory. So your buyers will love you if you're an agent and you have access to all these off market deals. So I have a, uh, a deal right now where, you know, the wholesalers wholesaling it, they're going to make 30 grand, um, but it's actually, they're going to make like 37 and a half and they're paying us, um, you know, seven and uh, seven, 7,500 to uh, bring the buyer, at least one of the agents on my team. And so, yeah, no, that's, that's the deal right there. All right. Solid. Well, you dropped enough gems today. I want to leave with these uh, really quick rapid fire questions. Uh, you got a favorite book for us? Oh man, I, I've got a thousand of them. So I, I love the Bible. I read the Bible every day and I think yeah. that informs my life, but I'll say, uh, you know, business book. Um, I, I said traction. If you're building a business track, you've got to read traction. Got it. Best habit that serves you every day. Uh, morning routine, waking up early and winning the day before noon. Miracle morning. Uh, best tools that helps you excel throughout your day. Could be anything. Notepad. application. Uh, best tools, I would just say my phone or, I mean, honestly, the best tool is is my network. I, I literally call um, people that are better than I am every single day and get, get advice from them. Got it. Uh, single family or multifamily? Oh, uh, I own single family, but I'm researching multifamily because I think that's probably the way to go. <laughs> Got it. Self-manage or outsource? Uh as far as uh, rentals? Yeah. Um, currently, I have my team like in a ragtag group, but I've got way too many rentals to continue that. I need to, I'm, I'm probably going to start a, uh, a project. Company. Group. Yeah. <laughs> Fair, right? Vertical yeah. integration. I love yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Uh, has your uh, business uh, directly benefited from uh, social media? Absolutely. Absolutely. Social media is incredible for us. Yeah. In any particular way? Um, I, when we learn to, uh, instead of create content to document content, um, there's a girl on our team. She's, you know, under 30 who's going to do, I mean, she's going to do like 65 transactions this year. Um, and in the DC area that like, like the average in our area is like four to six transactions in a year. So, um, but yeah, she's just all over social media. Every time she sees anything weird, anytime she sees anything odd, anything noteworthy, she's all like, anytime she's in a house, she's just always documenting it. And, and therefore like she's becomes top of mind for so many people. And she gets so many, so many deals from that. Well, listen, Chris, man, um, it's been more than real. Where can the people find out more about what you are doing uh, with your, uh, you know, all your companies, all that your team is doing, uh, even, you know, courses. I know we talked about in the beginning, uh, anything, how can we stay in connection with you and continue to build with you? Yeah. So um, for the investors that are looking to jump in the course, you just go to my, my website, chriscraddick.com. And also I have a reading list. I think a millionaire uh, business owner reading list that uh, for free, you just, you know, whatever. Um, we stay in touch on that. Um, and then uh, Uncommon Real Estate is, is our Facebook group and our podcast. Um, yeah. Just, brand jump in. Yeah, man, don't be common. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, so, so jump in, in the, uh, in the Facebook group and, or listen to the podcast. And then on, on Instagram, it's just crad rock, C R A D D R O C K, uh, old high school nickname. And, uh, I work to, uh, answer any DM. So anybody that responds to me or sends me a message through there, I will do the best I can to make sure I answer it in a timely fashion. Absolutely. Again, can't thank you enough for stepping into the lab, giving us some real tactical, practical approaches. That's what the lab is all about. You came, we saw you conquered. So thank you so much for stepping in the lab and being uh, so valuable to Experiment Nation. And just like that, folks, we are out.